There we go. All right. L'chaim. L'chaim. Water, if it's wine, if it's coffee, if it's tea, water, seltzer. There we go. L'chaim. Let's drink. To good health. To getting back together in person. Yes. And to, to all good things. So healthy summer. All right. Let's get into it. Straight into it. Keep your wine close by. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So this is our seventh and final class of the course that was called Code to Joy. And the objective of the course um, was to uncover where joy comes from and how to attain it and then hopefully apply it and live happier lives. And we looked into Torah and Judaism and found some very profound principles and practices. And each class explored another principle to finding inner peace, finding joy, and we'll quickly recap. And then we'll talk about what the final principle of this course is tonight. Okay, so lesson one, way back when, sorry, let me turn off my sound on my notifications somehow. Um, lesson one taught us to focus on the blessings in our lives and to find happiness through gratitude. And to this end, we introduced the Jewish, or we spoke about many, some of us might already be familiar with it or might already be practicing it, the Jewish daily gratitude ritual of saying Modani when we wake up. Um, also, you know, the, the blessings that we say on food, the blessings before, the blessings after, those practices of mindfulness and gratitude help us focus on the blessings in our lives, which is one good way to attain happiness. Lesson two taught us to cultivate a healthy and joyous self-image and by, by removing the focus on our on self and focusing instead on our mission. So everybody wants a positive self-image, and we learned that the best way to do that is actually to focus less on yourself and more about what you're in this, what you're needed for and less what you need, right? What's my mission? And the more you focus on your mission, the more you will have a healthier and joyful self-image. Lesson three laid out the roadmap to guide us towards our mission. So in lesson two, we said, stop focusing so much on yourself, this and self-awareness and self-discovery and self-improvement and self this and self that. Start focusing more on what you can, what you're needed for, what you can do to make the world better, to make your relationships better, to make the environment better. And that will bring you more happiness. And then so that was lesson, going back to lesson two. And then lesson three, let's just say hey to Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Hey, can you hear us? Yes. Great. Welcome. We just got started and we are just recapping because it's the last class of this course, the different principles that we spoke about throughout the course um, and the principles of, of attaining joy and um, implementing joy based on Torah and Jewish um, principles. So we're up to lesson three. Lesson two told us don't focus so much on yourself, focus on your mission. And then lesson three went into helping us figure out what our mission is, because it's like a big word, you know, focus on your mission and what you were brought to, what, what God created you to do. And then you're like, what, what is that? So lesson three was about figuring out our mission and fulfilling it, which is central to our happiness. Lesson four talked about anxiety. And we talked about the idea that our thoughts 
control our emotions and our thoughts are, you know, we, we tend to think that we can't control our thoughts. Whatever pops into our head, pops into our head. But we learned that A, you, your thoughts can control your emotions and B, you, we, act, we do have the ability to control our thoughts. And yes, a thought can pop into your head, but we have the ability to dwell on it and to feed it and to let it stay in our head or to replace it. So there is a power that we have to control our thoughts and a solution to changing. Um, and we spoke about a solution is to change our pattern of thinking to a more optimistic one rooted in a trust of God. And that will help us with anxiety and stress and worry. Lesson five taught us, oh, I taught this one, I liked it, that our weaknesses and our, we all have weaknesses. We're not meant to be perfect. And we talked about that weaknesses are not, are not just there to be tolerated or to be accepted, but really to be embraced because, um, and, and to find joy in them. And, not, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't feel remorse if we do something wrong, but it shouldn't tailspin us into this debilitating sadness. The goal of Judaism, God put us here for a goal, and that was to transform the world. And that transformation is actually accomplished through that constant struggle. So that struggle is not just something to tolerate, but it's really something to find joy in because that is what we accomplish at the mission of creation through. And lesson six we, um, was last lesson. There was, we spoke about the aspects of our character that are open to change and how we can create space for improving our relationships with others. And so those were so far the six principles, the six ideas, the six, you know, psycholo psychological, you know, a lot of them are um, also rooted in a lot of psychology, not just in Torah and ways to find happiness. Today is our last lesson. So now we're going to level up. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, the final way to find joy, not the final in, in the world, but the final in this, in this class. And um, the idea, just gonna give you the punchline and then we'll go back. The idea that we're gonna talk about tonight is finding joy through Jewish practice. So a lot of the other ones were kind of ways to understand ourselves and our mission and thought patterns and being more mindful and being more grateful and all of that. And tonight we're gonna to talk about actually finding joy through Jewish practice. Now let's be straight, okay? I'm gonna straight talk over here a little bit. The notion that religion can contribute to happiness is not very popular. Right, it's typically the opposite, right? What are like some um, thought out there feelings about religion and and happiness? What is what do many think, not us, um, about religion and freedom or freedom of self and happiness and joy? What do you get out there? Anyone want to straight talk for me or I'll do it? Um, yeah. yeah, it definitely bring me happiness. And uh, through all that time of COVID, you know, I also um, increase my observance and study and... Uh, so Sandrine, you're you're speaking to the punchline, which was we're gonna we're gonna talk about how Jewish practice does in fact bring oh. us happiness, right? Okay, I said right? we're asking us for no, right. So I'm asking what what do you hear out there? I'm, I'm convinced. I'm you're convinced, convinced, right? Right. So for those that aren't convinced, not us. For those that aren't convinced, and you know, a lot of it comes from. Um, some popular psychology, but what, what is the feeling towards, towards religion and happiness? Dr. Maxi, were you gonna say something? Well, not related to that. I mean, to me, it seems like the popular opinions out there is self-centeredness brings you happiness, i.e. it's all about me, my truth, my pain, my this, my that, me, 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 my, my, my. 
and this brings you happiness. And I would submit based on my experience in my pediatric office, that this pandemic has driven uh, anxiety and depression and things like that absolutely through the roof because if you sit around and you, you just <laughs> make the choices that Sandrine and I and everyone on this meeting have made and that is to focus more on Torah study, focus more on prayer, focus more on Jewish practice, I submit that yeah it makes you happier but the world will tell you focusing on yourself, your needs, your truth, how you were hurt, how you were injured, um, is what makes you happy, is your own self-improvement directed by yourself, out of context with anyone or anything, or there's also the Madison Avenue message of if you buy this kind of dress, these kind of shoes, this kind of car, this kind of trip, this kind of whatever, that's what really brings you happiness, and religion is not, or faith, or your spiritual connection with Hashem is not so much in that picture. Okay, thank you. So, Yes, the notion that religion can contribute to happiness isn't, you know, maybe it's becoming, maybe it's popular, it's popular in this crowd, but often religion is thought by many to be oppressive, um, repressive, you know, requires subordination, um, it requires blindly following, it requires not asking questions, it involves punishment and retribution, and so those are not big contributing factors to happiness. <laughs> right? So I told you, well, I said, I'm, someone's going to say it straight. Um, in fact, Freud, the father of modern psychology wrote, I'm just going to read what he wrote. Religion is a counterpart to the neurosis, which individual civilized men have to go through in their passage from childhood to, to maturity. Um, many of Freud's students who developed the field of psychology after him regarded religion similarly. Um, as an unimportant phenomenon that at best deserved a decent burial. So in this climate, the idea of Judaism offering insights and pathways to happiness would have been a hard sell. So we are hopefully tonight gonna show that Judaism does contribute and can, can and does contribute to our happiness and not God forbid the opposite. And as I mentioned before, we're gonna talk about the high level, the very fulfilling and very intense joy that can be accessed only through the practice of religion, the practice of the study of Torah and the practice of mitzvahs. So um, the oppressive, hold on a second, let's look at a text and then we'll go back to what I was about to say. So text one, if you have a student book, it's on page 192. And if you don't, I'm gonna share my screen. over the place, one sec. Okay, text one, Adele, how do you feel about reading it? Oh, sure, um, that's, that'd be lovely. Um, psychologists who have studied whether religious people are happy or unhappy have often reached a general conclusion. Religious people are on the whole happier than non-religious. In the vast majority of studies, religious people report higher well-being than their non-believing counterparts. Even when researchers define religiosities in various ways, such as attending church or having self-professed spiritual beliefs, studies show that religious people are on average mildly happier. In one study conducted by one of the authors and the Gallup organization, about a thousand people living in St. Louis were contacted through random digit telephone dialing and asked to answer a survey related to spiritual beliefs and satisfaction. It was found that respondents who believed in God and in an afterlife were more likely to be satisfied with their lives. Some scholars have accused us of pushing religion and of not being objective scientists. Our response is that whether people are religious or secular, they can learn something about how to practice happiness 
from the findings of religion and happiness. Okay, thank you. Um, let's continue with um, some text about, um, about joy in finding joy in the service of God. So um, I actually wanted to go to text four. Okay, I wanted to jump around a little bit, but I don't want to confuse anybody. So let's go. Okay, text 2A. Text 2A is very short and sweet. Donna, can you read that for us, please? Okay. Serve God with joy. Approach him with joyful song. Okay, so we have a, a text from Psalms that, tell us, that tells us serve God with joy, approach him with joyful song. We're going to talk about all this in a minute. And to be another quote about serving God with joy. Nancy, will you read it, please? Dr. Maxi, will you read it? I don't know if Nancy can hear it. It is crucial that we experience joy in performing a mitzvah and in loving Hashem. Okay, good. So we taught, we read two quotes about, well, we read one about um, joy and religion and two about two quotes from, from sources in the Torah, one from Psalms and one from Maimonides about serving God with joy. We're gonna analyze these texts so far. Um, why are we taught, right? We just said to serve God, to serve God, to serve God with joy. Why are we taught to serve God with, jo with joy and that the experience of serving God should bring us joy? So for many people, the, re the relationship with God is not only not joyful, not naturally joyful, or um, it's from, uh, for many people, it's complicated. If you know, on, on like social media, you can write your relationship and, so people can people write like my relationship, it's complicated. A relationship with God for many people is complicated and often uncomfortable. Okay, so some people just, you know, avoid it or um, don't really let their relationship with God influence their, their, their minute to minute lives. Maybe sometimes they'll pray or they'll meditate or they'll study, but their relationship with God is complicated. So why is that? Why is that the case? Um, the roots, the roots for this discomfort is different from person to person, and we'll just go through some reasons why some people will have a um, complicated and often uncomfortable relationship with God. And so some of those reasons might be um, some people find that religion is hostile to science, and they're uncomfortable with that. Some people might feel like it's hostile to free inquiry, human progress, some of the things that we spoke about before. Others cannot tolerate what they consider to be blind faith. They just, they cannot tolerate seeing people faith blindly following and blindly having faith. Some people are disenchanted with the history of abuse of power perpetrated by some religions. And others are turned, turned off because they were taught as children in church or in Hebrew school that God is this big policeman in the sky who zaps people if they sin. And some people get stuck on the question why bad things happen to good people. And those are some examples of why some, a lot of us um, and a lot of people in general have a, a complicated or an uncomfortable relationship with God. Sure, there's more, but I think that gives us a good few examples. Now, as a, a story that I remember my father telling us that's actually in this course, which I loved, one of my favorite, and I'll share it here because the idea is that this God that is that we just spoke about, like this uncomfortable God that, um, you know, expects blind faith and expects not being questioned and expects you know you to be perfect otherwise he zaps you from the sky that god i'm also uncomfortable with and i also reject 
So the story that I love is um, in the town, there's a town in Ukraine called Berdichev. In the town of Berdichev, there was a proud self-proclaimed atheist who shared with anyone who would listen why it was crazy to believe in God. Once he confronted the famous Kabbalist Rabbi Yitzhak of Berdichev and explained why he doesn't believe in God. And he went on about with some of these, you know, God's um, expects this and expects blind faith and doesn't ask, let us question and rejects, you know, um, any pushback and, and zaps and punishes and da -da -da -da, all the, all the describing as very um, jealous and revengeful God. And Reb Levi Yitzchak replied to him, you know, sir, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in him either. So the God that we're talking about and the relationship with that Judaism and, and Kabbalah teaches to have with God is not the God that we just described, right? It's a, um, he is a, a, a loving, um, God, he's a father, you know, the relationship is a father and only child type God. It is an understanding God. It's a forgiving God. It's an embracing of our struggles, embracing of our imperfections, all of that. None of what we just said, but, um, so that all of that already just kind of reframing our, um, perception our of God already can start to help us, um, serve him with joy. And we'll read two texts of what is, so if that's, if what we just spoke about is not the proper concept of God, what is the proper concept of God? And once we explain the proper concept of God, we'll start to understand how it's possible to have this very joyful relationship with him. The so text four and text five are um, short texts, which will help us frame the proper, a proper concept of God. The so text four, let me scroll down for you. If you are in a book, it is on page 196. If not, it's on my screen. So one way that Judaism wants us to view God is this way, text four. Let's try. Nancy, can you hear me? Yes. Would you read yeah. text four, please? I was muted before, sorry. Oh, okay, go ahead. I was reading. I was reading. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> reading away. When we contemplate God's great and wondrous creations and perceive their <laughs> infinite wisdom that surpasses all comparison we will immediately love praise and acclaim god and we will yearn with tremendous desire to know him as king david stated i thirst for god the living god okay thank you so the first thing that we're saying hey charna hi the first way that we're describing to god is you know not this strict and scary policeman, but rather this um, God who has created this wondrous world is infinitely wise and infinitely loving. And um, that hope that may, um, if we meditate on that, and that should, if we think about it, arouse within us like a desire to connect with this wondrous, loving God. Um, and we'll talk about it a little more in a minute. Let's read text five, please, um, Sandrine. God is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will place my hope in him. Okay, so in text five, um, we're, we're, we're talking about an intrinsic bond that, that we have with God, almost like a parent and a child. Right? There's a portion of a parent and a child that's so interconnected, and that's similar to our relationship with God. So firstly, he's so wondrous and wonderful and loving and, and, and created this magnificent world. We want to be connected with that kind of, you know, that level of, of love and awesomeness. And also God is intrinsically connected to us. Um, so what, when people have this uncomfortable or complicated relationship with God typically comes from a faulty um, understanding of God. And when we gain a more mature understanding of his greatness and our intrinsic bond, which we just spoke about, we spoke about his greatness and our intrinsic bond, when we gain a more mature understanding of those two, we will desire to have a connection to him. Um, so the question that I'm going to put out there that we'll talk about for a minute now is 
we're talking about having a relationship with God. So we want to first make sure that we're perceiving him as this loving and um, wise and infinite and transcendent and God that created this beautiful world for us. And we're also talking about how we have this intrinsic connection to him. And therefore we want to have a connection with him and we want to have a relationship with him. The question that I'm just gonna put out there to talk about for a minute is we are human beings. God is God. When you talk about a relationship in the word relationship is the word relate. It's very difficult to understand how human beings and God can relate. When people have a relationship, they relate. They usually find things in common. So how are we, even if we do ponder his awesomeness and we do ponder our intrinsic connection to God and that arouses a, a desire to have a relationship with him, how do we have a relationship with God who is transcend, who transcends time and space, who is unlimited, who can create, who, and how do we as human beings who are none of those things, we can go on and on and on about the difference between a human being and God. And there's very, there's nothing in common and there's nothing really that helps us relate to God. So how then can we, even if we realize that we want to have a relationship and have a connection, how can we have a relationship if we are such dissimilar entities? And I'm curious before we go on, we'll look at some texts, we'll look at some stories, but if anybody does have anything to share about how a human being and a, who realizes that they desire to be close to God, how they can, how we can go about building a relationship with God who is so infinitely incomparable to us mortal human beings. Anyone have anything to share? Um, performing mitzvot. Yeah. Spoiler. I'm just joking. I'm kidding. Yes. Very much. I'm kidding. Performing mitzvahs. Yes. Anything? Anyone else? No, by talking, by talking, having a conversation with talking to God. Love that one. Studying Torah. Studying Torah. Going to shul. I feel a great joy when I go to shul, even if I'm feeling down. I just feel such a wonderful connection. And when that Torah comes out, I just I feel God is there. When you open those uh, the door to the ark, and he's there. I just yeah. Wow. I was going to say just modani. Modani. Yes, and we did mention that at the beginning when we oh. were going over the lessons, but you weren't there. Yes, no, Danny, okay. that is beautiful. Uh, being thankful. Being thankful. So what we're doing, what we're talking about right now, are different. we have this big gap between you know God, God and us, God and us, whatever. It's a very big gap. So we're bridging that gap, and some of the, all of the things that we're mentioning here are ways to bridge the gap. And so I'll give you an example um, some simple person, we'll call him Bob, is, happens to be illiterate, not extremely intelligent, and there he is taking a stroll through the grounds of Princeton University. And suddenly he sees Albert Einstein. And he is, Albert Einstein's walking around with some, some students around him, and they're talking and he's obviously, a, you know, he knows that the conversation's extremely like way above his level. Um, Bob has heard about Einstein. He's seen him on TV. He knows because he's heard that he's the smartest person alive, um, but he has no way to understand how and why and what that means and, and all of that. He just, and his reaction is like to be attracted to the greatness even though he doesn't understand it and to want to connect. Like he wishes that he had something that he can go up to Albert Einstein and connect to, but he knows that there's no way that, there's gonna, that they're gonna have anything. They're not on the same you know, intell intellectual level to have a conversation. So he doesn't know what, to, he doesn't have anything to say. He doesn't wanna sound like a, he doesn't wanna make a fool of himself, but he's standing back wishing that he had something 
that he can approach Einstein and make a personal connection with. And he, he swatches, he stares, he follows him. And he's kind of feeling like invisible and, and absent because he sees no connection between himself, his life and Einstein. There is just very little in common between his life and, and he knows he has nothing to say that would interest Einstein and or interest Einstein's intelligence. And therefore he is feeling like non-existent basically. Now imagine that at some point in him like feeling this way, Einstein would come up to him and say, excuse me, sir, um, can you tell me the time? Or excuse me, sir, can you walk me to, you know, can you point me to the restroom, right? So just that question for a favor is like automatically makes him, connects him, makes him feel like all of a sudden I was recognized, I was seen, we have a connection. He has a need that I can fulfill or he needs help that I can help him with. And just in that small action, that small interaction, that small action, now this commoner and the greatest minds have made a connection. So the analogy is obvious because when we see God, when we, you know, when we start to perceive God and his greatness and, and we feel like, what do we have? To, in what way can we relate to God? And we feel, we might feel invisible. We might feel absent. We might feel there's nothing that we can approach God with. When God gives us his mitzvahs, that's giving us an opportunity. Suddenly we have an opportunity to connect with God. So we're going to talk about mitzvahs now a little bit. And Sandrine, you did mention that when I said, what are ways that we can connect to God? So we're going to talk first about connecting. Well, mainly tonight's class is about connecting to God through mitzvahs and how mitzvahs are this incredible opportunity to connect very, very deeply with God. And that connection brings us can bring us a lot of joy, especially if we take a moment to just appreciate what, that, what we're doing when we do that mitzvah. Leah, that was a beautiful story. Thank you. Beautiful. It touched me deeply. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to switch to my shared screen again. And I'm going to ask Charna, let's see if I get it right again, to read, please. Um, give me a second. Text six. Okay. Um, <clears throat> go ahead. Okay. The word mitzvah is related to the Aramaic word zavta, which means connection. One who performs a mitzvah connects with God, the issuer of the commandment. This is the meaning of the Mishnaic phrase, ethics of the fathers, the reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah. The reward of the mitzvah is the connection, savta, it generates with God who issued the commandment. Okay, thank you. So stopping my share because I like seeing everybody's faces. Um, this is probably the mo the crux of, of the of what we're talking about this evening, and also a very, um, a very important and foundational principle in um, Torah and Hasidus and Kabbalistic and Hasidic philosophy, which is when you you say the word mitzvah, we typically translate it as commandment. Now, when you command somebody something, when you command somebody to do something. How much good does that do to your relationship with them? <laughs> like, right? Like zero, okay? It's, go, it's doing zero and possibly damaging your relationship when you're commanding somebody to do something. So there's this, we're, gonna, we're, we're like setting this table for a complete paradigm shift of what, a mitzvah is because the word mitzvah like it does it translates on a very very basic not wrong because it's in there in the root but it's just a it's it's um misunderstood or what's just taking it on a very very surface level and then missing the whole point of a mitzvah is god commanding us to do something and that feeds a whole you know god's up on sitting in the sky on his throne commanding us to do things 
being the policeman, zapping us if we don't. And we know with our relationships, with our friends, with our parents, with our spouses, with our partners, with our children, that just giving somebody a command is un, is it's it's doesn't help, it doesn't contribute, it doesn't build, it probably damages the relationship. So we are now going to re-translate the word mitzvah. And it's, this is from the previous Rebbe, this um, quote. He says that the word mitzvah is really from the root word savta, which means connection. One who performs, I'm just rereading it. One who performs a mitzvah connects with God, the issuer of the, command, of the commandment. So it's not actually, a mitzvah is not actually a command, but rather an opportunity for connection. So like never again is mitzvah to be translated or understood as commandment, but rather as a opportunity for connection. Okay, now we're going to, the same quote had a second profound point, which was, this is the meaning of the Mishnaic, Mishnaic phrase, the reward of a mitzvah is the mitzvah. So there's a famous quote, schar, mitzvah, mitzvah. When you do a mitzvah, the reward for mitzvah is a mitzvah. And that also is, can be understood very, very simply. The reward of a mitzvah is another mitzvah meaning like usually one mitzvah leads to another or, you know, like we're paying it forward. You do one and then it was um, brought you so much joy or brought someone else so much joy. So it leads to another or just presents an opportunity for another or the person that you did a mitzvah for then goes on to do another mitzvah, which is all wonderful. But that is not even close to what this is really saying, which is schar mitzvah mitzvah, the reward for a mitzvah, the reward of doing something that gives you the opportunity to connect to God is the connection that comes through that, through doing that mitzvah. And um, as an example to that, if someone said to you, you know, what's the reward for hanging out with your best friend? Um, obviously the answer is the experience is the reward. So that's the same thing over here. The same is true with mitzvahs. The reward for doing a mitzvah, like it's, you know, the same God that we don't like the idea of him like being a punishing God. Also, this other side of that same coin is like, how much does it mean to us if we know that if we do mitzvahs, we're going to get a reward in the world to come? Like, it doesn't mean much to most of us. So, and, and really, that's not what we're, what we're doing mitzvahs for. Same way we're not, not sinning, so we don't get zapped. We're also not doing mitzvahs so that we get candies in the world to come. It's the schar mitzvah mitzvah, the reward for a mitzvah is the opportunity to connect with God. Um, and what's nice about the mitzvahs, which was nice about God, because sometimes we can be like, oh my God, 613 commandments. Like how many things can you tell somebody to do? You know, like I know at home, it's like, get in, do your homework, get into bed, brush your teeth, have a shower, put out your clothes for tomorrow, make your lunch. Like that's seven. Like 613 is a lot of things to command somebody to do. It sounds like a very bossy God, but no, now we're saying every mitzvah is an opportunity to connect. Well, how nice of God to give us 613 options. So if one's hard for us, we have 612 other, other ways. And if we're, if we like, um, you know, if we like eating, we have all these opportunities to do mitzvahs through eating. And if we like decorating, our home for Shabbat and our sukkah and our Pesach table, we have all these opportunities to do those mitzvahs. And if we like giving and we're generous and we have all these opportunities for charity, there's 613 opportunities of mitzvahs to do to connect to God. And this means that even if we struggle with one, there's so many others or one, you know, one type of mitzvah, there's so many others. And it also means that we can connect with God from every aspect of our lives. Um, eating, sleeping, family life, work life, all of that. Thank God. Um, okay. Let's skip a little bit. So even though, well, just actually just summarize before we go to the next point, um, even though having a connection to God might seem impossible because he, we, so we have not, we don't have much in common. Um, God overcomes this challenge. God helps us overcome this challenge by giving us all, giving us mitzvahs. And when we properly understand what a mitzvah is, we realize that it's an opportunity for connection. And no matter how distant two entities are, 
If one asks the other to do something and the other complies, a connection is made. And this is why our mitzvah performance should bring us joy. Um, and we have 612 of those, 613, I don't know why I'm saying 612, 613 of those opportunities. Um, and text eight, um, just really saying what we're saying um, along the lines of what we're saying. Text eight, we lost Sandrine. Okay, when I pull up my screen, I don't see everybody. <clears throat> when I, so again, when I pull up, when I share my screen, I don't see everybody, and I, but I don't wanna miss anybody. So is anybody not yet um, read? I'll read. Okay, go ahead. Let Israel, re excuse me. Let Israel rejoice with its maker. The meaning of this verse is that we ought to rejoice in God's own joy. God rejoices and is happy to dwell in our physical world. Okay, so now we're just kind of layering on how much joy mitzvahs can bring to us. So the first layer of how much um, um, joy a mitzvah can bring to us is that it gives us an opportunity to connect to Hashem and that should, could and should bring us a tremendous amount of joy. Now we're adding a layer to that by saying that not only does connecting to God bring us, not only does the connection to God bring us joy, but also when we do a mitzvah, we are accomplishing, we are helping God accomplish the purpose of creation. Now think about that. Now you're, you're part of the purpose of creation. Does that make you feel good? So now you're doing a mitzvah, you're connecting with God. You're doing a mitzvah, you're helping God accomplish the purpose of creation. So now we're extra happy about doing the mitzvah. Um, now we're gonna have a question that we have with all things, with all blessings in our lives. So now we know that we have so many opportunities for mitzvahs and there's such rich and deep opportunities for happiness and connection to God. However, just like everything that we have in life, we can, we do have a challenge, which is that a lot of times when we have, when we accumulate a lot of good things and we're grateful, you know, we try to be grateful for them, but we can, and we often do, take them for granted. So we can have a similar problem with spiritual spiritual um, goodies and spiritual riches that we can start to take them for granted. So we don't want to get into that pattern of taking the opportunity to do mitzvahs for granted because we, if we take them for granted, then we miss the opportunity that brings so much joy. So how do we make sure that our mitzvahs do not, we don't start taking them for granted? And that is very, the answer to that is very practical. And that is that when we do a mitzvah, most mitzvahs are um, accompanied with a blessing. So when you light Shabbat candles, you say a blessing. When you wash your hands for bread, you say a blessing. When you, not all, but when you um, eat kosher food, you say a blessing. When you sit and when you eat in your sukkah, you say a blessing. When you shake the love and etrog, you say a blessing. There's most of the blessings are accompanied, most of the mitzvahs are accompanied with the blessing. And that blessing um, if you analyze the, the words of it, which you're not going to analyze right now, but the idea that we're saying, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu, Melech Olam, Asher, Kedshanu, B'mitzvot, Tzivanu, what we're saying, we're taking the time to, especially if we think, well, we need to think about what we're saying, but it helps us, it gives us the time to ponder the value of the mitzvahs and how they make us happy and how lucky we are that God commanded us to do them and how that gives us a connection to him and how lucky we are to be part of the accomplishing um, the purpose of creation. Um, Okay, so now we know why we have, um, how mitzvahs, can, how to connect to God, how to, through doing mitzvahs and how mitzvahs can bring us joy and how much joy they can bring us. Um, and now we're just gonna let, take it up one more notch. And I think that will be our final point, which is text nine. Um, who would like to read it, Adele? 
Uh, it is a great mitzvah to be happy all the time. Okay, how does that make you feel? <laughs> no pressure. Just be happy all the so, time. So I, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, surely that's a qualified statement because how would one be happy if, say, God forbid, when one's parent passes? Good question. We're going to talk about it right now. Does anybody have anything to, uh, to also to ask or to answer or to add before we just look well, at it? You wouldn't have happiness unless you knew unhappiness. Right. Otherwise, okay. Yep, I love that. Okay, so let's talk about why constant happiness is a Jewish value and also how and if constant happiness is attainable. So what we spoke about until now was the joy that we have through doing mitzvahs. So the first idea to help us understand what being happy all the time would look like is that to, is to break down the barrier between the times in our life when we're doing mitzvahs and studying Torah and in the rest of our lives. So there's like, could be, not saying for sure, could be that there's just, we compartmentalize praying, talking to God, studying, doing mitzvahs, practicing Judaism, and then everything else. So the, so the first thing that we want to do is just take down that, that barrier. They're not... You know, we're either doing things in the service of God or we're doing everything else. And the idea that we study is that whatever we're doing is all can and all should be in the service of God. So there's not, we're not, there's not two orbits that we exist in. There's, you know, it's not like the, the, Sometimes we're being Jewish, not being Jewish. Sometimes we're practicing Judaism or practicing our religion. And sometimes we're with our family, on vacation, at work, at a restaurant, all of that. So those are two spheres. So they're, they're, if, we, if we separate the two, then, we, um, then it's going to be much harder to have joy all the time because we, now we understand how to find joy in the service of God. But if we don't, if we try and connect the two and we tell we understand that in everything that you're doing, you're doing in the service can be done, can be done in the service of God and for the service of God. Then all of a sudden, like we're constantly in that state of connection to God. Um, let's read that inside. I think it will sound probably better than the way I'm explaining it. So text 10 in the words of Maimonides, um, Donna. We should direct our hearts and the totality of our actions to one goal, becoming aware of God. One who always follows this path continually serves God. Our sages instructed us regarding this matter, saying all your deeds should be for the sake of heaven. King Solomon too declared in his wisdom, know him in all your ways. Okay, so there's never a moment in our there should never be a moment in our day or in our life that lacks meaning. There's never a time that we're taking a vacation from our mission and from our purpose. Eating, exercising, working, vacationing, sleeping. They're not, I mean, they can be mundane activities, but they don't have to be. If we perform them in order to have strength or to have resources to serve God, then all of a sudden, they too become part of your service of God. And there's a cute story. I don't remember the names, um, but there was a, um, I think it was one of the Chabad Rebbe's that called over um, somebody that worked in his home on maintenance who wasn't Jewish and said, um, gosh, I, don't, like, I know the story in the form of a song. So I have to like sing it to myself. Um, basically like, why do you eat? And he was like, you know, because I need to have strength. Why do you need to have strength so that I could um, work? Why do you need to work so that, I, so that I could have money? Why do you need money so that I could eat? Like there was a cycle of like, 
eat, sleep, work, just so that you could do more of that and the pleasure that you get from that activity. And then he called over somebody who worked in his home that was Jewish. And he said, why do you, you know, why do you sleep? So he, and the man answered, so that I could have energy to serve God the next day. Why do you eat? Um, why do you work so that I can have money to buy food? Why do you need food so that I can have energy to serve God? And it just, you know, the, the comparison just showed us the difference of the two ways that you can approach the mundane activities of your life. So we know doing the, the mitzvot is, we understand is connecting with God. But now what we're saying, what we're adding is that even doing the, all the mundane activities, if they're done to have energy or to have resources or to, for whatever reason to, to serve, to then serve God, then all of a sudden those become holy mitzvot and holy activities. And those are also being done in the service of God. And when you are doing everything in the service of God, there's more joy in the, every single action is transformed to something, to something holy. And so with this mindset, your life is just as never ending, never ending moments of service of God and never ending. And then by, um, extension, never-ending moments of joy because you're serving God in every single moment. And the same happiness that we find when we do a mitzvah, we now find in every single moment um, because every moment is an opportunity to connect to God. Um, okay, so it did not really directly answer Joy's question, which is how do you find joy in a tragic moment. And I'm curious if anybody has anything to say about that. Because you're obviously not supposed, doesn't mean you're supposed to be not sad when something sad happens, right? You're not supposed to be like, oh, someone just passed. I'm supposed to be happy. No, that's not what we're saying. So what could we be saying? So that by saying Kaddish or observing those rituals associated with that, that is part of your larger service to God. And in that way, you are serving God and you remain connected, even though in the modern English understanding of the word happy, you're not happy, but you are connected and you are continuing your service to God, even in your grief. I imagine that uh, Joseph probably wasn't real happy when he was hanging out in the prison, but yet he maintained his relationship with God and continued to focus on serving God. And then his opportunities came, but first and foremost, he maintained his focus and his service to God while he was sitting in the middle of prison for reasons that were not good. Magnificently said, yeah. I, I could not have answered better. I think that really that's the experience of, of whatever we're going through. If it's challenging and there's sadness is not, it's not exclusive to also understanding that in that moment there's opportunity for a deep deepening your connection to God. And while you're grieving, you're also appreciating that there's an opportunity for a deeper connection to God or a deeper connection to that person's soul through the, through the, the, the guidance and the practices that that religion gives you. So yes, it's not like we're not, you don't have to be, I don't know, acting silly and happy in a, in a difficult moment, but there's so much opportunity for deepening your connection with God, deepening your connection with your faith, finding faith. And all of that can bring you, um, can bring you so much Joy. And as we said at the beginning, it's a, it's a very um, deep joy, you know, unlike the frivolous joy that you might have from eating a bar of chocolate. Um, okay. Let me see. I think that is mostly what we wanted to get through. Um, well, oh, one more idea, actually, I just, I did want to mention one more thing that I think might be in the appendix, but I really liked it, is that there's also, when you, um, ha, I'm going to read it, actually, okay, this is going to be the last point, because, and I'll read, I'll read the text, it's text 12, so we'll go to it, um, if you have it, it's on page 202, um, and it is from the Rebbe, so the Rebbe said this, when a plant is fully provided with all that it requires to grow, for growth, earth, water, air, etc. It is liberated from all of its worries and concerns, so to speak. 
Although it is immobile, doomed to remain rooted in place for its entire lifespan, it nevertheless enjoys the full freedom that a plant can experience. It is truly free despite its lack of mobility. An animal, however, is different. Even if its needs for food, drink, etc., were to be provided, it would feel horribly restricted, imprisoned in the harshest manner if it were to be immobilized and forced to forever remain in one place. For it would be denied one of the primary features of its existence. The primary feature of a human being is intelligence. Humans would feel imprisoned even if they were granted full freedom of mobility. If they were denied their primary aspect of being, the freedom to utilize their intelligence and live mindfully, they would be miserable. And the Rebbe develops this a little further by giving, with, and I'll give you an example. If you give a toddler a 20 piece puzzle, they will be very um, challenged and happy. And if you gave that same, if you gave that same 20 piece puzzle to an adult, they would feel very frustrated by its simplicity because that adult could do a 2000 piece puzzle. So, and, and that they're not giving the opportunity to express or maximize their potential with a 20 piece puzzle. So it will feel frustrating to them. So similarly, if our, if our ability and our search for meaning and depth and joy and connection to God isn't given a way to express itself, we will, we might not be able to articulate it, but we will end up being feeling frustrated and live, feeling like we're living in a self-imposed prison. A human being who has higher needs and deeper needs and higher and potential for so much connection to God, if they're not, if they're not actualizing those opportunities, that will, they're not only missing out on those opportunities for joy, but they're actually going to end up very frustrated. And this is why so many people speak of emptiness and feeling a void and they're searching for meaning and they're searching for this and they're searching for that because we do need more. And the joy of, um, you know, this type of joy is not just the icing on the cake, but it's crucial to our makeup and to our happiness. And so this concludes this lesson and also this course but before we do that you can if you are comfortable I mean you can all definitely look at it but if you're comfortable you can even fill it out on page 204 if you have it and if you don't sorry if you don't I will scroll down um choose a mitzvah that you will perform during this coming week in the box below or in your head for a minute, think of a short meditation that describes the reasons why you consider this particular mitzvah a beautiful gift. What aspects of the mitzvah do you particularly enjoy? So again, choose a mitzvah that you will try to perform and why you chose this particular mitzvah, why this particular mitzvah that you chose is meaningful to you um, and why it will bring you personally so much joy anybody is writing and willing to share would definitely love to hear it And I did, I just, I just looked over my notes to make sure that I covered all the points and there's one more and I don't want to miss it because sometimes some of this feels like um, not practical or unattainable, like finding joy in mitzvahs and being happy all the time is just not so realistic. So the final point that I wanted to make was, which, which is taught in Jewish text in Hasidic text, and that is that sometimes, like the fake it till you make it, in this type of in this in, in finding joy, fake it till you make it is um, is can can work. So sometimes we're not really feeling it, 
But if we just know that we're supposed to be happy and try and be happy and smile, even physically, uh, this, there was a really, good, a really cute um, um, experiment that was done that I'll tell you, but there's definitely a fake it till you make it opportunity here, which is in text 13, at all times, assume a demeanor as if your heart were full of joy. Even if at the moment, this is far from the case, such behavior will eventually lead you to truly feel happy because behavior and action impact the heart. So that is my final point. And I'll tell you quickly the experiment that I thought was cute. There was a, um, a study in psychology where researchers asked the volunteers to how funny they thought a certain cartoon was, or I guess a few cartoons were. And while looking at the cartoons, the, the scientists gave the volunteers a pencil, okay? Some were asked to hold the pencil between their teeth without it touching their lips, okay? So like that, okay, yeah, make that face, okay, good. And some were asked to hold the pen with, in their lips without it touching their teeth. I think that. A third group were asked to hold the pens in their hands. When you hold a pen in your lips, you look as though, when you hold a pen with your lips, you look as though you're frowning. When you hold it with your teeth, you're grinning. The volunteers with a pen between their teeth, between their lips, thought the cartoons were less funny than the volunteers holding a pen in their hands. Those with a pen between their teeth, whose mouth was just in the shape of a smile, thought it to be the funniest. Simply contracting the muscles into a smile changed the way they perceive things. And while I was saying that, I remember that when we, one of the, the parenting courses that I did is called Conscious Discipline. And that oh, this is my, this is what we're ending with. It's going to say Lahaim to this. Um, the Conscious Discipline teaches that in every moment that you're triggered or that you're dealing with talking about parenting, but it's really with anyone, anything. The first person, the only person that you have to manage and control is yourself. You don't even have to ever worry about controlling children. It's really, it's all about like, it's really all about yourself and controlling and learning to control yourself, learning what your triggers are, learning how to talk to yourself and to parent yourself. And so they teach to, like it's a lot of breathing exercises in this conscious discipline. And um, the way that they teach it to children is using the acronym STAR, stop, take a deep breath, um, or maybe smile, sorry, smile, take a deep breath. And the, when, when I did it with a trainer, she explained that smiling, it's, it, it, it's not just smiling for like, just to tell a child something to do, but actually smiling and taking a deep breath are both like, the muscle, what's happening with the muscles when you smile and what's happening with the brain and the oxygen when you take a deep breath are both impact then your, like your state of your brain. So like moving your muscles, for some reason, moving your muscles upwards on your face like affects your brain and bringing oxygen in obviously also affects your brain. So there's something about making your muscles on your face go upward that impacts you neurologically that then impacts your behavior. So if this is all feeling like, ah, oh, how am I going to practice this joy? It's not, doesn't come easy. It doesn't come naturally. Then just start trying to act joyful, put on a smile, and that will lead you, that will lead to impacting your heart. Um, and with that, I say l'chaim, to finding joy, in the mitzvot and in the mundane and to recognizing that there isn't actually mundane, it's all can be and is being done in the service of God. So l'chaim. And if anyone has anything to say or to ask or to share, I would love to hear from you. I have a question. Go ahead. 
-hmm. Was the word for connection safta? Is that, and if, unless I'm wrong, is that not the same word for grandmother? Great point. Savta is with the letter tsadi. tsadi, tsadi oh, okay. And it's an Aramaic. Grandmother is savta with the samach. Okay, thank you. I would. Good question. No, I wouldn't want you. Hey. 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 crashed the party. <laughs> oh, so I, I heard that it's, um that after nine o'clock men are allowed to join. So I thought like, oh my gosh, it's totally, no, but really what I, I wanted to, first of all, Leah, thank you. And thank you all for being part of this. But I also, can I kind of do a quick mention of what's on tap for next year RCS? You guys want to know what next year's RCS course is? Sure. I have I have the information already. This is going to start, we always start in Kislev, or Scottish Kislev, which is usually November time. Um, and it runs for about seven months. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'll show you, we just got this information like a week ago. So this is breaking news. I haven't had a chance to really go through it, but I'll just show you quickly what, what it is. Um, okay, here we go. Can you guys see that well connected? Does that come up? Okay, so this is the new RCS, well connected. It's not what you know, it's what you do. And I thought I was, you know, I thought like what a perfect, you know, the ending was about doing a mitzvah and being happy. And this is literally a course <laughs> about practical Judaism. Um, I see here on the side, like this little left bar, it says well connected is just the thing if you're feeling mitzvah curious, or I love that phrase, or if you simply want to find out more about practical Judaism. Beyond that, if you're looking for a deeper engagement with Jewish ritual and how to live in indeed, indeed, this is just the thing to do. Okay, so um, it's about the it's about the pra it's practical Judaism, seven months practical Judaism lesson one unroll the scroll. Lesson two, so it's mezuzah. Lesson two, soul food, kosher. Lesson three, endlessly blessed. It's about blessings and prayers. Lesson four, a slice of life, which is about challah and bread. Lesson five, pray it forward, prayer. Lesson six, the kinds of kindness, chesed, tzedakah, giving. And lesson seven, to live indeed. This is life cycle mitzvot. That's so great. It's, it looks like a great course. Anyway. Just does. wanted to give a plug for next year. Thanks. It does look beautiful. All right. Well, hopefully next year, Rabbi, do you think we'll be in person next year? I'd love that. You know what? If we're in person, I'm thinking with those practical classes, and I haven't, I haven't thought of this before, so this is right now on the fly, but what if there was like a hands-on session for each one, like creating a mezuzah cover for the mezuzah class and baking challah for the challah class? And what, what were some of the other ones? Um maybe designing a sitter cover for the prayer for the prayer one um do maybe like a half an hour of an activity and then like an hour of the of the class i think that could be very nice i like making challah in a half an hour yeah exactly <laughs> uh, what, hold a, on i'll sign um, up Leia, is magic, it is magic it, yeast lay is it doable or no yeah with magic yeast oh perfect we have <laughs> some of that <laughs> no hold on one second if everyone's gathering at chabad we could already have the dough ready to go, right? And it could be shaping. We could, figure it, out. We could figure it out, yeah. We could, put a, we could put a rover on Mars. I'm sure we can figure out 30 minute challah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. What about that instant rapid rise stuff? I've seen it in the, in the thing. I don't know, I'm a newbie at this stuff. I don't, Kugel's my thing, challah. I eat it, yeah. that's about it. All right. Thank you. All right, so we'll see. See you all hopefully before then, but back together again for some Torah study in a couple months. But hopefully, oh, yeah. we'll see you enjoyed the class. It was thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So nice seeing everybody. Thank Have you. a great you. summer. Have a great summer. And we'll see you all soon, please, God. Good right. job. Good see you all in Good person. Night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Shabbos.